Hello and welcome to each and every one of you. I'm Louise Hicks, part of the Barts Health team and delighted to be your host for this really special event. Great to see so many of you have joined us. This event is being recorded, which will enable those of you who are not able to join us this evening to be able to watch later. A big shout out to those now working across our hospitals. I hope you've enjoyed watching the dance video in the lobby on the way in, and that's been performed by our staff, so talented. Thank you to all involved in that production. Do post your comments throughout the event in the chat box, and we also have a Twitter feed. We've got somebody very special watching that Twitter feed and feeding that into me, joined by our chief nurse, Caroline Alexander. So uh, keep those comments uh, throughout the event in the chat box and our tweets, uh, which you post using the hashtag BH over the rainbow, will show in the Twitter tab in this platform. With the large number of guests, I'm sure you'll understand it's not possible to take questions during the event. I know some of you will be hosting parties at home or be with colleagues or friends on teams. And some of you may be uh, watching alone or whilst at work. Wherever you are, you're not alone as part of Bart's health team, of course, and we truly want you to enjoy this over the rainbow event. It was a nice surprise to receive this drinks mat uh, for the, this evening. And I love the fact that the joining links on one side and don't forget the QR uh, information on the back so you can take a photograph and um, link that into our mosaic during the evening. I hope you're using this though and you've poured your favourite drink and are sitting comfortably. And don't forget, if you signed up to get discounted delivery on Deliveroo, this should be activated now on your account. So sit back, relax and enjoy the evening. Let's kick off though with a special song from Amir. He's a London born musician with a burning passion for music. His songwriting talents have led to so many opportunities and also working with Grammy uh, winning producers. The band are proud to share for the very first time, we're so lucky, exclusively for Bart's Health, their new song, Got It For You. Let's hear from Amir.
got it for you thank you so much i hope you guys enjoy an amazing evening over to you louise wow thank you amir what a great song and a wonderful start to our event we have a fantastic lineup for you uh, during which we'll be looking back really over the last 20 months and hearing from lots of our staff and volunteers We've got some special guests and we'll be announcing the winner of the £50 Deliveroo credit and the baking competition too. I also have it on really good authority that we've some amazing singers at Bart's Health who we'll hear from a little later. We hope you're all making the most of our virtual photo booth and let's see how the rainbow mosaic is looking so far. This is our opportunity as Bart's Health to build our rainbow. So come on, let's all do a selfie. Uh, so just uh, scan your on the QR code. It will take you into here. You can take your selfie, do a few uh, little uh, pieces around that and then send it us. A few stickers, upload your selfies and we'll build that uh, rainbow. Let's see if we can do that by the end of the event. This is such fun, I'm loving this. What a wonderful legacy from this one moment in time and to be part of our history and future. You can check the life uh, progress of our mosaic uh, by clicking the View Life Mosaic link below. So uh, keep those selfies going and keep um, putting your interactive feed into Twitter. We'll pick those up uh, shortly. So um, this event will last around an hour, after which there'll be uh, lots of varied treat rooms for you to enjoy, ranging from bake-alongs, ingredients list in your virtual party packs there, uh, skincare, drinks and snacks, information and more. They'll be open for the rest of the night for you to enjoy. I was thinking a bit of Dermalogica for me might be helpful, uh, but I'll leave it with you to choose the one that suits you. On behalf of all of us, though, I'd like to give a really uh, special mention to Bart's Charity, who have generously funded this event, to whom we're hugely grateful for making this possible. Thank you, Bart's Charity. Before we go back to where it all started this year, let us take a moment though to remember loved ones and acknowledge those who've lost their lives over the last 20 months, including some of our staff, family and friends. Caroline Alexander, our chief nurse, would like to share a few words. The last 18 months of this pandemic has left its toll on all of us. As a trust, we have had the privilege and honour of caring for patients and their families at their time of greatest need. I do not underestimate the toll this has had on all of us. We also have had personal bereavements and the loss of close family, friends and colleagues. It's been cruel and unusual times, and we haven't always been able to say goodbye or celebrate the lives of all those extraordinary people as we would have hoped. We must remember the joy of having known that person and the comfort of having them in your memories is never lost. The knowledge that for all of us, our lives are limited, makes life even more precious, more momentous and extraordinary. As Christine Carrar says, remember me when I am gone, but not with sorrow, pain and grief. 
Think of me as a turning leaf that in the winter falls from its branch, to be born again in spring and live forever in your heart. And as Thucydides said, what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Thank you, Caroline. That was such a moving tribute and hugely important to us. And so, where it all began. Going back to February 2020, we'll hear how you, our amazing staff and volunteers, adapted and got through this together. It's been amazing to see so many of you here tonight. Tonight has been a celebration of just a few of our heroes. Drink, be merry, and dance the evening away. Good night to you all, thank you. With an ICU, we knew something was coming and we started preparing for it in the February. It's a respiratory disease, we know how to treat this. And you recognise what's happening abroad and you think to yourself, well, they're just not getting it right. We'll be OK. And then one became two, became four, became ten. And then you realise that it's actually happening and we're right in the middle of it. It very clearly became obvious that it was a multi-organ condition and a lot of the conventional treatments that we'd always relied on didn't work. Your bees to a honeypot just desperately trying to learn. I was in touch with people in Italy, France. We were learning the drug regimes, we were learning proning. It was a huge weight of responsibility. I was really feeling completely overwhelmed and not being able to control things in the way that I normally do. And seeing all of our normal structures that do control things falling apart. It changed everything in the hospitals, from even walking down the corridor to having lunch, to seeing your colleagues and looking after patients. Planned surgery to put on hold. We have to explain to those patients why that's happening. But people still fall, crash their cars. That service has to be maintained and be functional. So how do you maintain a safe patient services with the resources you have? How many staff can we lose? Who's going to get sick? Who covers me if I'm ill? How do we get medicines up to the wards? Drug charts back and forth and there came a point when you realised that actually the whole way that we were working just needs to change. So every specialty, every part of the hospital had to restructure their service. At the same time, if there were rising cases of COVID within the hospital, that meant it was rising in the local community and that's where we all live. How am I going to keep my kids safe? I'm coming to work and work is where these patients are going. I do remember my family saying, should you be going to work? I don't think you should go to work. You don't need to go to work. Please don't go to work. And I said, yes, I have to go. It's my role. I'm a key worker and I'm making a difference and it's important. The day everyone will remember will be Mother's Day in 2020 when the NHS in London was asked to plan for the most significant increase in critical care beds. I drove through central London and there's nobody there. Broad daylight, nobody there. No lights on in the offices, no coffee shops, no one on the streets. You can see all this architecture, you can hear the birds, but it felt like the soul had been taken out. It was very eerie taking the train to work and usually it would be standing room only. I even took a photograph because it, it felt so surreal. But actually when you came into work then um, you weren't in lockdown. It was very much everything is completely manic. But there was this feeling of safety in a space that you knew. We allowed people to innovate because we had no option. They showed that courage to take decisions that were way outside of their comfort zone. And because of that, we saved a lot of people. 
Everybody, even those who didn't have any ICU background, they had transferable skills and we could utilise that. Overnight, we had to redeploy basically the entire staff of surgery. We moved them to a completely alien environment. Really showed huge resilience then and a lot of bravery, I think, really, because it was putting people in really uncomfortable situations. So I think for us it was how do we get through each day, but also how do we get them through each day. We became almost a single disease hospital and the difficulties of staffing and running a hospital like that was immense. About the 8th of April 2020, I was bracing myself to come back to Newham, but I remember being really, really scared. I was 15 weeks working in intensive care. T to me, it, even now, it was, a, it, was a, it was a hard time. Our staff room was like a massive, just offloading area. No one would ever understand what you were going through the same way that your colleagues would. And then you'd be like, right, come on girls, like, we, we've got to go again now. Medicines is an integral part of every patient's journey, particularly ITU patients. All of a sudden, you had a lot of patients all needing the same medicines. And so that became um, a huge problem. We deal with the ventilators. We just needed so many repairs, so many installations. Some of the things, even the things, the negative things you don't want to think about, it will still stick with us and we will just learn from it and remember it for the rest of my life. Extraordinary situations are not simple to deal with and there were times when people felt exposed, felt unable to cope, but somehow each team and each site managed to pull together and that was only because everyone looked after each other. You could not help but see the impact of the social determinants of health. It brought home to all of us, if we weren't already aware, how much equity in healthcare matters. We had stark data that confirmed what we were seeing, what we were hearing from colleagues. Those from black and Asian minority ethnic groups were being were disproportionately affected, but also had poorer outcomes. That was extremely hard. It wasn't just that, it happened that intersection with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the murder of George Floyd. There was this heightened consciousness of what I knew existed, but then it was right there in your face and you couldn't get away from it. There are issues of discrimination, there's statistics, there's evidence. Let's do something about it now, as opposed to just sweeping it under the carpet. Let's do something. And I felt that change. And I think when Alwyn championed the equality and diversity agenda, putting it in as a trust objective, that makes a difference. When somebody applies for a job, they apply for work in an area that they want to work in. They apply for something that they're comfortable doing. But with the pandemic, you're not given a choice of where you're going to go. It was hard, but you wanted to be part of the response. Because you've got to get involved. That's the thing you, I got straight away, that irrespective of how I felt about it, got to help sick people. That's my primary function. It's not about me anymore. It's about the community. It's about playing for the species, aren't we, with the pandemic? I was a newly qualified nurse working on a trauma ward, and then the pandemic hit. Unfortunately for me, I, I'm one of the clinically vulnerable people, so I ended up getting told, you know, um, you're going to have to shield. No one really knew what to do with me, and I didn't really know what to do with myself. I went back to uni to study to be a nurse um, because I wanted to help people. Suddenly, I'm feeling like I'm letting the team down. I've ended up getting into the events team at least with this Over the Rainbow event, I'm helping create something that will thank all the members of staff. It's truly remarkable hearing your story, so fantastic. We're so lucky to have all of you and all of you out there that are listening. Thank you for sharing these and thank you for everything that you have been doing. Who could have imagined at the last Bart's Health Heroes event that that was in front of us? 
Without further ado, though, I hand over and go live to Alwyn Williams, our wonderful Chief Executive. Alwyn. Good afternoon, good. and words can hardly express my heartfelt gratitude and pride to every one of you. You've all truly gone above and beyond from saving lives, ordering PPE equipment, keeping everything so spotlessly clean, to ensuring everyone got paid during which we moved to a new and unfamiliar situation overnight. And it was truly inspiring. Your determination and desire to succeed and get through this was beyond remarkable. Changes that may not have ordinarily happened, which have now changed the world forever. We've never witnessed anything like this on this scale in our lifetime, not just managing new ways of working, but alongside massive personal changes in the way we live our everyday lives. This evening's event is of great importance to me and my executive colleagues. From the outset, I knew we couldn't single out a few hundred people to be shortlisted for our more usual and all our volunteers. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you, every single one of you, whether you're directly or indirectly employed by us. One of our many volunteers, you should all feel immense pride with what you've accomplished. And never ever have I been more humbled and proud to be your chief executive. I'd like to introduce now a very special guest who's joined us this evening our new chair, the Right Honourable Jackie Smith. Thank you, Alwyn, and hello, everybody. Today is my 14th day as chair at Bart's Health, and I can't think of a better way to finish it than to be spending time reflecting on the last 20 months and celebrating the phenomenal work that you've put into caring for our patients and caring for each other. And thank you for the warm welcome that you've given to me. Today, I was able to go and visit Whips Cross. And that's just part of the visits that I'll be paying to all of our sites and to teams across the trust so that I can get to know you, so that I can get to learn about your work and so that you can tell me what I and the board can do to support you. But for now, I want to listen to your stories and to enjoy this fantastic event this evening. You're going to be hearing more from Alwyn and other execs uh, later, but for now I'm going to hand back to Louise and I really look forward to meeting you all. Thank you, Jackie and Alwyn. Lovely to meet you, Jackie, and a huge Bart's Health welcome to you. Thanks, Alwyn. What an inspirational leader you are, and thank you for all you've done. Like all of us, we know that the last 20 months will have been just as challenging for you and your family. But let's have a bit of fun now. Let's find out what you're all drinking out there. We're going to run a short poll which will appear on your screen. Once you've made your selection, submit your answer. And whilst we're waiting for those results to load, whether you're drinking a cup of tea, a gin and tonic, maybe a soft drink, what's your selection? We'll have a look at some of those lovely messages that are coming in and see what you're all up to. And um, on Twitter, we can see that Bart's Health have got cakes everywhere. What is it about cakes and Bart's Health? And all day, uh, people have been enjoying the fact that Rachel and the team have got um, National AHP's Day. They've been doing games and all sorts of things. So massive shout out to our allied health professionals and clinical psychologists. We can see lots of uh, tweets there from them. Jen, you're drinking G&T and Jan has got Prosecco ready to pop. Thanks, Jan Flint, uh, for that. 
and uh, even celebrating in her pajamas. So we're going to go more on that a little bit later. But um, we can now see the poll results and uh, we can see that actually wine is quite a popular one. We've got 22% of you with wine. Um, a lot of you have got a non-alcoholic fizzy drink. Very sensible. I'm very impressed. Um, and uh, some of you have got spirits in a mixer. So we've got a bit of a range there. And uh, so next time we're all together, able to go out for a drink, um, the drinks are on me. Well, perhaps not for all 24,000, but we'll have a little think about that. Thank you so much. And um, our top drinks are there for you all uh, to see and uh, carry on enjoying and relaxing uh, this evening. It's now time though to move on and reveal the first of our winners. So let's spin the wheel to reveal the winner of our Deliveroo 50 pounds credit. Over 750 entered this prize draw. That's really fantastic. So the wheel's spinning. Where will it stop? And Kavita Patel, you have won. Well done. Congratulations, Kavita. Um, Ros and George in the events team will email you. Now let's hear some more from our staff. I know we all had a really busy couple of weeks filming during the summer, and this is where staff shared their reflections. Important to note that these reflections just come from the heart. They're not scripted. It's what people wanted to say. Let's hear from them now. I did a lot over lockdown to expend a lot of stressful energy out of work. So I decorated my flat. <laughs> Um, I started watercolouring. I started rewatching 24. I went back to a uh, cross stitching. You can see. I did learn how to do Pilates on Zoom. I've been singing since I was 12 years of age with my friend Larry. I am practically a stranger. I couldn't get to Plymouth to sing with him. So we started doing videos and then we put it on Facebook. Walking, going out, exercising. I hadn't done very much of that. May the 1st, I got my Brompton bike and I started to cycle. Now, 17 months on, I am cycling nine miles through three burrs. It has names in the back of the people that donated the bike. It was a bad time in, in my life, but I, I achieved. I had some friends who sent me some sunflowers and I wasn't expecting it. Little things like that out of the blue made me realise who I really care for and who really cares back. In an odd kind of way, it allowed a lot of time and space to reflect as an individual and as a family on what our real priorities were. Because I did a single parent and I worked, I enjoyed, you know, catching up with the lost time with, with my fast growing son. I think I have had a tendency to put work first before family and um, so one of the legacies I will take away is, is to ensure that I've got that work-life balance um, that works for everybody. We perhaps never really thought on such a grand scale about perhaps the flexibilities that, you know, work life can have. With these new technologies of video meetings that we do on MS Teams, it saves a lot of time and we don't have to keep rescheduling meetings. So Some of us can actually be on MS Teams and while others can actually physically come in if they prefer to. What I quite enjoyed was yeah, to learn the new skills. We had to produce videos, both for patients and for staff. And instead of being in contact with a limited amount of patients, I was in contact with a, a large number. I attended um, a couple of memorial services for members of staff we'd lost and trying to offer words of comfort to a young family who've lost a parent is really difficult and then when you go home that evening you kind of just want to give your own kids a, a bigger hug. This is a very difficult time. Even your children are, you know, is scared of you because you are working in the hospital and sometimes you want to hug them and there's a little, there's quite a, a little bit hesitant, you know, and it's quite painful. I have a little two-year-old and everybody else, all they want is to talk about, oh, is work bad? Are the COVID numbers bad? She didn't care about COVID and she didn't care about the numbers or how 
ill the patients were. She just cared about if I was going to play with her or not. She was a lot of the motivation to like be me as well as the nurse me. My son and my daughter would always ring every day to make sure I was right. Most of my days were spent saying that to everyone else. And that really was, you know, that, that was, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Probably one of the, the big things for us was trying to create one of the largest critical care units in the country. We could see the numbers increasing. We needed this unit. Normally projects like that take years. We did that all in six weeks. All the people who were involved in that were really positive about the outcome. What we have there is a legacy of critical care beds for the future. Arts Health then was asked to set up and operationalise the Nightingale. And that was a terrifying, wonderful, amazing experience, uh, coming together with a group of people, IT, to estates, to clinicians and nurses, uh, so many people just running towards danger. And although the Nightingale Hospital didn't treat an enormous number of patients, thankfully that was one of the success stories. What it did do was symbolise, I think, what the NHS was there to do and that we, we would do whatever was necessary. You really felt in the darkest of days that everyone was rooting for the NHS and, and that made a huge difference. It was extraordinary. You've got this swell of people genuinely wanting to help. Veterinary services with gowns and masks the food parcels, the hot meals for the teams, the coffee stops and the ice cream vans that, that popped in. Across the country, people were clapping on the doorstep. For most of my career, my family and my friends haven't really had a clue what I do. Friends and family were calling in to ask if you're okay, make sure you look after yourself at work. It was nice to see that in a moment of crisis, the vast majority of people really rallied round in an extremely positive way. I was working in a garage, actually. I've seen it all over the TV and news every day how many people have sadly passed away and I wanted to be part of it, I wanted to, to be honest, just to be there for everyone. I thought to contribute to the community as a volunteer and spread happiness all over, we should do extraordinary. No, small things, small steps can also matter. You felt that not only were you starting to actually make a difference, but we were feeling that in the feedback that was coming back from the staff at the hospital. Volunteering has kept me going through the pandemic. It made me have somewhere that I can go and see people face to face rather than over Teams or Zoom, which had made, because I live on my own. So the first lockdown was awful for me. I've had both my parents pass away in here. and I thought that would put me off, but in fact, it's built bond stronger. I really want to give back and give the support and love that the nurses and doctors gave to my own parents. I had coronavirus. I had to go to a separate unit in the hospital for patients who were doing dialysis that had COVID. The nurses, they were very calm. And you know what? They got us through it. Every bit of information they were getting, they were telling us, I'm back home. I'm with my family. I'm with my grandson. I've got a granddaughter on the way any day now. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here now. My mother went in for a planned surgical procedure. Unfortunately, there were some underlying issues with her own health that um, nobody was aware of, and she um, had to be um, intubated. So she was in an induced coma for three weeks. The communication hub was one of the best things that, that Bart did through that time. We knew what was happening at a time where we couldn't be there and it meant everything. I got to the hospital. I didn't notice any kind of change between morale. And it's very difficult because people are wearing masks, but you, you know when people are smiling under that mask. Extraordinary measures in extraordinary times. How once unthinkable turned into the possible. Truly amazing.
What an incredible journey we've been on together. It's so important we take those few moments to reflect back and see just how much has been achieved and how we all drew strength in different ways to get through this together. I'm asking you all now out there, wherever you are, what are you most proud of? Take a moment to celebrate your achievements. If you're with somebody, tell them, what are you proud of? If you're on your own, don't worry, nobody will know if you shout it out loud. What are you proud of? We've just heard staff and volunteers talking about Teams calls, and many of us have spent a lot of time over the last 20 months on Teams, WebEx, Zoom, etc. You may have got new hobbies and a whole new set of connections. How was it for you? Did you have to do other things also whilst being on Teams? Let's run another poll and be honest. What's the strangest thing you did whilst attending a meeting online? Keep it clean, please, people. We'd love to know. So whilst we're waiting for the results to load, let's have a look at how our rainbow mosaic is looking. It's looking good. Do continue to take your selfies though and upload to the mosaic so that we can start to see that rainbow shape forming. We're seeing on Twitter lots of feed as well at the moment and really uh, love the reflections. Gary, Gaza, you're busy with your cheese and wine. Tom, lovely to hear from you and your beautiful reflections on the staff stories. So what's the strangest thing? Eating breakfast? Some of the other things are um, there. What are the strangest things that you have been able to do uh, during your MS Teams? You've been, uh, quite a few of you have been cooking, that's interesting. I know that quite a lot of people have had to deal with their pets, animals, answer the door, receive a whole range uh, of different callers. And I do know that somebody had to do some emergency ironing. I'm not sure what constituted that. So um, thank you for sharing uh, those secrets. And I think we've got more talented at how we uh, manage all of that. You could also let us know in the chat if you're doing anything special to celebrate this evening. Have you got dressed up or are you relaxing in your comfy PJs? Whatever you're doing, we hope you're taking time for yourself and enjoying the evening. Now, it's time to run our other prize draw. Such an impressive array of entries uh, for our recent Over the Rainbow baking competition. I think you'll agree when you see some of them. And it's back to that cake as well. Why do we like cake so much in Bart's Health? Who better, though, to select the winners than Yan Su? Yan trained as a biomedical scientist and now works for the Francis Crick Institute as a laboratory research scientist. She was a 2017 Great British Bake Off contestant. Over to you, Yan. Hello, everyone over at the Barts NHS Trust. Um, thank you for inviting me to uh, pick out um, the three bakes that I like best for your competition. Um, I wish you all good luck. Um, and here are the three that I think were the best. The third is Pfizer Khan, who did the macarons. Um, they are not an easy bake, so they look perfect, um, all equal size, so neat, and I love the colours. So well done uh, for coming in third. Second, I chose um, Sauda Badat. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, wonderful bake and all those uh, sugar flowers must have taken ages to make. Um, uh, you were only picked to the post very, very, very marginally by uh, Gladys Kiroga. I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly, so I apologise if I haven't. Um, 
so neat and tidy. Um, love the design, so colourful. And even the bake, sometimes it's just the look, but you've got the whole package. Uh, the cakes looked really nice and airy and um, must have, used, again, must have taken ages for you to do. Um, so the winner I picked is Gladys Kiroga. Well done to you and um, well done to actually ev everyone for um, entering this competition. It's a wor wor worthwhile. Wonderful looking bakes. Congratulations to Pfizer, Sada and Gladys. They were fantastic, weren't they? Uh, you have won some e-vouchers and Ross and George in the events team will be in touch in due course. Totally fabulous and such talented people we have here at Bart's Health. We have a few more surprises lined up for you uh, during this evening's event, but let's hear a little bit more from our incredible staff now. Life was difficult and complicated. We had to close the churches, the mosques, the temples, there were so many rumours and myths and things going around. There was a lot of fear and anxiety because they couldn't see. They didn't know what was going on. And in the absence of information, people had just jumped towards Facebook and WhatsApp, whatever it was, and listened to nonsense. And yet the people who had the information were not in a position to communicate that effectively. They, they, they didn't have the cultural competence or the reach into community to have those conversations. And then I was emailed to say, would I be interested in joining the Bart's Faith and Community Group? We would meet up once a week, local councillors, faith group leaders, and also hospital representatives, and ask those experts about what is happening. It meant that we could communicate reliable, safe, and trustworthy information. We were kind of reassuring families about the healthcare that they were getting and also providing kind of spiritual and uh, religious care. I think I lived on adrenaline for about three, four months. At times I've kind of blocked certain bits out of it because they were so draining. Bart's Trust reached out to us when the cafeterias and the restaurants were closed down and all their staff were working long shift hours. We ended up doing over 1,800 meals per day to hospitals, vulnerable, homeless, etc. By working with Bart's, providing those hot meals, through that came trust. So when the end of life calls were being made to families, the hospital let us reach out to families to do group video calls, to say their goodbyes. We want to tackle stigma, particularly within mental health. It's very difficult for people to even acknowledge the sort of um, stresses and troubles that they're encountering. So what we want to do with Bart's is to be able to tackle that stigma within the community. The pandemic has taught me a lot about myself and my own mental health. I think at the start of the pandemic, I struggled a lot with health anxiety. That was quite a new phenomenon for me, and I think it's probably a new phenomenon for a lot of people. You can't help being anxious. It's one of those things that your body decides that's what you're going to do, and you'll do it. I was looking after the people I was working with. We were the redeployed staff, but there were occasions whereby I had to stop and think and ask myself, who's going to look after me? I am generous and I give to other people, but I ignore me. I don't bother, I don't take the 10 minutes to go and have a cup of coffee on my own or to go for a walk or read a book. It's like I felt so lonely. I could go Monday to Friday without seeing anyone except for the people in the supermarket. <laughs> If we say to people you need to reach out, it puts the responsibility of someone who's suffering on them rather than having the awareness or the communication skills to be able to reach in and say to them, how are you doing? Use the ask twice rule. Psychologists help teams with debriefing after difficult incidents or simply with reflection sessions. And I think that's been a really positive change. And getting the investment from the charity to have a permanent team of psychologists available for staff as well as patients I think is, is critical. This is a, a moment in time where we can make a real difference for our staff. People finally acknowledge that actually we give great care when we give great care to our staff. A key part of protecting people's well-being is that they need to be able to feed that desire for altruism that we all have within us um, but they also need the time to be selfish. 
We've had fabulous um, donations from Bart's charity that have helped us to upgrade some of the staff facilities. We've set up wellbeing hubs. We want those wellbeing hubs to be a permanent feature of the hospitals as a bit of a statement of a gratitude for all of the service that they've given. Something that I've taken away from this past year has definitely been the importance of music. Times of crisis and suffering really highlight how important things that bring us together are. I'd, I'd love there to be more music in these places. You know, you don't often have time for that kind of thing. You know, I think that's the danger with hospital environments. They can end up being very functional. It's just emphasising the humanity, I think, in these, in these clinical spaces. We were told to get ready before the vaccines were announced. So we didn't actually know what the impact would be. We just knew that, yes, we had to get this vaccine into as many arms as possible. We were stuck in this holding pattern of lockdown and waves going nowhere. And this was a promise of a better day. I led on the pharmacy operational rollout of the vaccines within the four hospitals. We thought it was something we would need to put in place for January. Um, and I got a meeting request on a Sunday afternoon saying actually we're going live on Tuesday. And what that meant was we had 48 hours to pull it together and we did. As the vaccine was being developed, you also heard the rumblings of people saying, I don't really, I'm not sure about this. A lot, lot of communities were suspicious of a, of a, of a new drug. So it's, it's something that, they, that Bart's really took on board and understood quite rapidly. So we immediately knew that the national programme is not enough. If people don't want to come to us, we'll take the vaccine to them. We would upskill our staff about doing um, vaccine hesitancy conversation with a member of public. And we've vaccinated the homeless, your asylum seekers, any population that is lost in the system. In many ways, the second peak was worse for many, many reasons. It was about a 40% increase in numbers, but we'd learned a lot as, in terms of what we needed to do. So we had pharmacists working within ITU. The nurses were working under phenomenal amounts of pressure and everything pharmacy could do to make that that bit easier was, was critical and important. I was managing the workforce hub and we put out a call for volunteers to go and support with critical care. People from all grades volunteered to go and work at a weekend. I did do a few shifts as a healthcare assistant. Just personally, it was humbling to do the job and realise just how hard the job is when you work as a healthcare assistant and how important a role it is. And also very uplifting to see the compassion that people were showing to strangers, you know, it's what we call the needs of strangers and the way we respond to it is um, deeply moving if you observe it close hand. I remember being in ITU quite a few times and a patient would kind of suddenly pass away and the, you know, the nurse would be affected, emotionally affected. And I think about it, there's no connection between the nurse and, and the patient, but they felt a kind of responsibility of looking after that person as just as if, as if one of their family members. It was a privilege to see the amazing job that they did. The hopeless, helpless stares, the tiny smiles, hidden behind those frightened eyes. The guilt as I have the strength to walk away. As nighttime falls, as day begins, the monotony for you never ends. The eyes the very window to the soul, yet no story can be told. It's important for everyone to find a way of releasing their feelings and processing their emotions. Wrapped up in the NHS blue to protect me from you. The hope some of my love, compassion and care shows through. The team spirit and the wartime mentality was just huge. I marvel and will never forget the lives saved, the taken ones, and pray the occurrence of this twice does not beget us thrice. People died and our colleagues died, but there were over 4,000 people we got home. 
you've got to realise every single member of staff in every single department has worked for the greater good. It was nice how everyone kind of just um, helped each other out regardless of their job title and their grades and what department they worked in. For that period everybody kind of worked for one department. Before Covid, you wouldn't class the domestic cleaner as a key worker, you wouldn't address the maintenance man as a key worker but all of a sudden I've come part of the team and in a way I was happy because I was like yeah I work in the hospital key worker. I felt like a bit of a superhero. <laughs> I know that I've played a vital role because had it not been security the virus would be like would spread more. Yeah I'm feeling happy to save life. We're all putting in a shift at home or here everybody was working everybody cared. We all formed a chain each of its links, there were strong links. All our hospitals were running flat out. Then we started to see the numbers decreasing and I can't express the sense of just sheer relief. We worked with a real compelling purpose in whatever phase and I'm immensely, immensely proud. There's a sort of modesty around, well, we're just doing our jobs. But of course, it was so much more. There was no talk of job plans or job descriptions. You thought people had got to the end of what they could give. They just found more. I mean, I knew that they were good. I didn't know they were that good. I actually spent the last nine months working from home. And in the last month, we've actually been able to come into the hospitals for the first time, which has just been so good. Let's start opening the service up in a cautious way. The noise and the busyness of the postnatal ward returned. Now you know a lot more people in the hospital, a lot more people are more visible. You kind of, it's, there's not so many kind of faces that are strangers anymore. Some people were in my unit that I might have sat quite near, but I didn't know who they were before, and um, they wouldn't have known me. I'll never forget the people I was working with, this, particularly this last year. Yeah, I just feel proud to be part of what my trust and what we've done. I really want to just to carry on and just make my team, my family, the public proud as, as I can. If we break down some of those little silos and we, we step out of our comfort zone and we leave our tribe and go speak to those people across the hallway, we just work better. There is a Maya Angelou quote, which is, do the best you can until you know better, but once you know better, do better. And this year's been the epitome of that. Because of the uncertain things that happen to us, we become more uh, compassionate, more sensitive to the needs of your colleagues. I can see more kindness came in the people. Everyone now become approachable. And I wish everyone can carry on this in, in, their, in their habit. But we are very forgetful people. We, we forget things very quickly. We need people to celebrate what they've achieved by sharing it with others. So we need to get out and share that story of our learning and the difference it's made. In five and ten years' time, our teams will be the teams that are teaching. They will take all of this learning and be the generation that tackled the, the pandemic and learnt on the hoof. It's been a horrible experience in so many ways, but it's also given us a significant catalyst to make enduring clinical changes. It's given us the tools to reframe our approach. And it's not just about COVID, it's about everything we do about public health and healthiness. Now we're having discussions about what does the right model look like? And we have over here the art of the possible. Um, and we have on the other side what it was like before. But certainly we're, we're much more closer to, to the art of the possible. Amazing stories shared by our staff on how we've all drawn strength from our colleagues, our community, the wonderful wellbeing hubs and a whole lot more. Uh, such wonderful poetry there from Cara and uh, also such a wonderful opportunity, our multi-professional teams coming together. Looking at the tweets we're seeing lots of shout outs for our volunteers, 
for our pharmacy teams and people really proud to work at Bart's Health. Somebody's put Bart's Health for life. That's really something we can get behind. With the outpouring of public support, we've really got some special personal messages for our staff and volunteers. Let's hear it from our special guests now. On behalf of all of us, thank you. Without your care and support, this would have been a considerably more difficult, harder year for everybody. And it's because of the hard work that you have all provided that we have come through this. Hello everyone, I'm Babs Brand, Russell's mum, and I'd like to thank all the volunteers and staff at Bart's Health Hospitals for all they've done during the pandemic, over and above what anybody would have expected. I hope you all have a really wonderful evening, whether you're with your colleagues or maybe on your own. Just remember how special you are. I'm here to help celebrate the work that you all have done. All of the staff of Bart's Health and the volunteers, you've made a huge contribution to this pandemic response. And I want to say thank you. Since we last gathered together, we and the rest of the world have endured a global pandemic. It has been truly brutal, traumatic and sorrowful. I've seen astonishing commitment to care and to each other, great flexibility, creativity and astonishing resilience. Yet again, it's brought out the best in Team Barts. And as this is my last video to you all, I'd like to, th like to thank everybody in Team Barts and I hope you enjoy your evening. Guess what? I'm over the rainbow too. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm somewhere which is quite foggy. Um, so there aren't any rainbows here, but I'm very jealous of what you guys are doing. And firstly, I actually just want to say a massive thank you for the amazing and fantastic work you keep doing. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed and we love you for it. So keep up the wonderful work and have a great and wonderful time. Carry all of us over the rainbow. Thank you to all staff and volunteers at Bart's Health for your hard work this past year. Please enjoy your Over the Rainbow event. Carly and I are delighted to have provided the 11 Foundation Tranquility Gardens at Whips Cross Hospital. It was designed to promote well-being at the hospital and we're happy to see the staff enjoying it and benefiting from it. It's important to us that you have a safe place to connect with nature, to rest, reflect and recuperate. You deserve it, you really do. Thank you again for all your wonderful work have a great night, everyone. A huge thank you to Bart Health Trust. Thank you for going beyond what was expected and being true heroes. Thank you so much for everything you've done. It was about a year ago that we came up with the idea to run a party on Zoom with our friends to raise money for uh, the NHS heroes. And the uh, culmination of that was taking 10 NHS heroes to Royal Ascot in 2021. It's been uh, a couple of tough years. We've been through this uh, crazy pandemic and we find ourselves as a chef, a restaurant owner, doing uh, little and stay home all day. But luckily enough, we had a chance to uh, do some uh, lovely charity work for NHS. Uh, we've been able to feed uh, the nurses which they're fighting their life um, against uh, the COVID about 6,000 meals and for me it was uh, so rewarding. So I hope this is not going to happen again but you can count on us, we can keep supporting you and don't forget you're amazing and thanks for everything you have done for us. I just want to say thank you so much to all the amazing hard work of the staff and the volunteers and everybody at the NHS for all the amazing work that you've done over the last 18 months. Of course, all the work you did prior and all the work that you continue to do today. Thank you so much. You guys are literally frontline soldiers for all of this. The things that you've had to see, the lives that you've saved. Honestly, I'm going to repeat myself. I can't thank you guys enough. Truly heartfelt messages, which are a real testament to you all. And I'm sure so many more would have wanted to contribute. 
At this point, I'll wish you a fun rest of the evening. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us and hope you're enjoying the event as much as I am. Sending you all love and respect. We'll now go live to Adam, Lucy, Charles, Heather, and then Alwyn closes this part of the event. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Louise. As much as we've all lived through the pandemic in the last 18 months, I'm sure that, like me, hearing directly the stories from colleagues has brought back memories of that time in a very powerful, um, emotional and, and heartwarming way. But I just want to draw out two themes that have struck me this evening. Uh, the first is uh, one that's described by Martin Griffiths as I've got to get involved. And we've heard from faith and community groups, from taxi drivers, from restaurants, from non-clinical colleagues, friends and family who really offered support and wanted to provide practical help uh, to work alongside the caregivers who many believe, even though staff don't admit it, that they were the real heroes. And secondly, the powerful reminder that every member of staff at Barts is a person outside of Barts and life has changed for many of us. Families who were worried each time you went into work uh, or may became ill themselves and social connections you have that became broken due to lockdowns and the cancellations of activities of normal life. But wellbeing has clearly been helped for many by the many and varied offers that came from work, uh, but also that reconnection with nature or cycling or spending quality time with loved ones. And as we move forward to the next set of challenges we are undoubtedly faced, I'm confident that if we hold on to the positives that we've learned during this period, together with the skills and commitment that are just evident all around us, we will continue to serve the communities of East London when they most need us. And I'll hand over to Lucy. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Team Barts Health. Watching the reflections from the teams, I'm struck at how many of the familiar words are, uh, how familiar the words are disbelief uncertainty emotional community compassion and kindness in that context team Bart's health have innovated and, and striven for good patient experience we may not have known the answers but we absolutely work together to seek the solutions be it ppe be it vaccine hubs be it the research and the treatment plans set out for our patients the sense of composure team members portrayed whilst advocating for patients, their families and each other enabled many rapid changes to occur. The impact in our communities will be long felt, but the strength of the team Bart's Health, your perseverance and advocacy working with our community will be part of the lasting legacy of the last 18 months. I thank you and I'd like to pass over to Charles. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, as these wonderful films show us, these last 18 months have been full of an astonishing mix of emotions. On the one hand, overwhelming feelings of responsibility, guilt and anxiety. On the other hand, immense pride, astonishing teamwork and sustaining camaraderie. For me, at a personal level, there was the guilt of contracting COVID, having to go off sick and then giving it to my partner. At a professional level, the intense anxiety of the inexorable rise of COVID cases every day, wondering when and whether that wave would ever break. Guilt too about the extent of what we were asking our teams to do to look after patients in ever increasing numbers and fear of what would happen to patients if we couldn't. But contrasting with that and to some extent consequent upon it, is an immense feeling of pride in the speed and scale of our response to the pandemic. We've simply never been more effective, more compassionate and more responsive. What was asked of our people was given without question, humbling and awe-inspiring response beyond measure. Whether at St Bartholomew's, at the Nightingale or across the Trust, you gave of your best and your best was more than good enough. Thank you so very much. And over to Heather. Thanks, Charles. And what's really come home to me tonight is just how much was going on in the Trust. 
and I loved hearing from the community leaders and our patients and their relatives. Um, looking back already, it almost doesn't seem real, um, which I think is a sign that we're in a much better place just a few months on. Um, and now that we're out of the immediate crisis, I think we can see one thing really clearly, that collectively we did a good job. You all did a good job. And um, the other thing to say is how much privilege it feels uh, to be looking back as someone who was part of it um, and who was part of us as Bart's Health, making such a difference. Um, there are lots of challenges ahead, but as long as we face them together and look after each other, we will continue to do a good job as we make things better and better for our patients and our colleagues. Um, and I'll hand over to Alwyn. Thank you, Heather. Thank you all for those truly memorable reflections. And I'm sure we're all reflecting ourselves on the experience and memories that we have. Um, so as I conclude, I'd like to uh, thank everyone that's been involved in making this Over the Rainbow production possible. Thank you, Roz and George in the events team, Shane for his wonderful designs, Steve from the AV production team, Angus for filming, to everyone, all our staff who took part in all the films and all the photographers. A very special thank you, Louise, for being a superb, fantastic, wonderful host this evening. And a very special thank you as well to Bart's Charity, uh, who have made this possible. So in a few minutes time, when the live stream ends, why not take a comfort break and then join the treat rooms from kitchen cocktails and mocktails, more bake along, disco, yoga and skincare, and there's something for everyone to enjoy. You deserve it. So to access, click back to event agenda button and click on the treat rooms. You can join as few or as many of the eight treats as you wish, you decide. But before we enjoy our treat rooms, I'd like to raise a glass. A glass to all that Team Barts has achieved together over the last 20 months. How remarkable each and every one of you are. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. So cheers to you all. But it's not quite over yet. The moment that we've all been waiting for and we're absolutely delighted to bring you a very special rendition of an iconic song I'm sure you all know, and so beautifully arranged by Bart's Choir, sung by our own staff, and it's truly incredible. So please take it away, our Bart's Health singers.